Okay, we are coming into our technically first study in the book of Ecclesiastes. Last week, if you were with us, we did the introduction, which was important. Uh, I found myself refreshed uh, in reminding myself of uh, Solomon's life and the pivotal uh, tipping point in his life where he uh, walked away from God. And so the book of Ecclesiastes, as mentioned to us before last week, it is a personal diary of a man who um, turns from God. And as Sherry pointed out last week, uh, how in the world could this man endowed with God's wisdom do such a thing? And we have to look in the mirror and ask ourselves the same question when we do things that are contrary to what we believe um, in the word of God. And so today we want to talk about Ecclesiastes 1 through 11. That's all that we're going to do. And I want to read that passage to you before we start to develop this. And hopefully you have your Bibles with you. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanities of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What advantage does man have in all his work, which he does under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Also, the sun rises and the sun sets, and hastening to its place, it rises there again, blowing towards the south, then turning towards the north. The wind continues swirling along, and on its circular courses, the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, they will flow again. All things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, see this? It is new. Already it has existed for ages which were before us. There is no remembrance of earlier things, and also of the latter things which will occur, there will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. So Solomon, right off the bat, declares. Um, his frustration with living life. Remember last week, the phrase vanity of vanities is used about 30 times, and then under the sun equally as many times. And so in the first 11 verses of the first chapter, we have the main thesis of Solomon's perspective on life. And I've summarized it this way. The emptiness of life as observed in Solomon's world of existentialism. The emptiness of life as observed in Solomon's world of existential, existentialism. Now, what does that big word existential, existential or existentialism mean? It's a 20... 20th century philosophical movement centering on analyzing one purpose of existence, hence the word existential, and then determining what is right or wrong, good or bad. Such a pattern of living leads to situational ethics, despair, fatalism, and emptiness. So this existential approach, Solomon 
is living in his life is what he determines is right or wrong. That's his basis for determining what is right or, right or wrong. It's his observation. And that becomes his, if you please, practical theology. And as we will study through the book of Ecclesiastes, you will see situational ethics and you will see his despair and fatalism and emptiness. And in fact, we see that in the first verse or the second verse of the first chapter. Vanity of vanities and vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Now, the Spirit of God did not record vanity, says the preacher. He says vanity of vanities. It is a Hebrew Liter literary device of overemphasis, vanity, every cotton pick and thing that I see or I put my hand to is vanity. Now, vanity is not a man or a woman looking in the mirror and telling themselves how great looking they are. That is a modern definition of vanity. In the Hebrew, the word means vapor or breath. Vapor or breath. So you begin to get the idea there's not a lot of substance to vapor or breath. The Hebrew word is H-E-B-E-L, Hebel. H-E-B-E-L. Now, in the New American Standard Bible, Habel is translated a variety of different ways besides vanity. And I think if we take any one of these words that I'm going to suggest to you, it'll unlock the passage even further about Solomon's mental and emotional and spiritual condition. For example, the word could be translated delusion or empty, fleeting, fraud, idols, nothing, useless, worthless. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, delusion upon delusion, all is delusion. Fraud upon fraud, all is fraud. Useless upon useless, all is useless. Worthless upon worthless, all is worthless. A great way to start out a book of the Bible from our perspective, but the Spirit of God is going to use this man's life seeking to find purpose and meaning apart from God and demonstrate to us today lessons that we need to learn. So again, the emptiness of life as observed in Solomon's world of existentialism. Now let's begin to go through the first 11 verses together. Verse 2, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Then he poses a question here. What advantage does man have in all his work, which he does under the sun? Now, I think that's a rhetorical question because the answer is obvious. There's no advantage for a man who works under the sun. There's no advantage. I think of the parable uh, that Jesus told about the rich man and his barns. Luke chapter 12, verse 18. And God had blessed this man's life. And he had an abundance. So much so that the barns that he had to contain the blessing of God were inadequate. They were not large enough. 
So he says to himself in verse 18, oh my goodness, what should I do? I know I will build bigger and better barns. Now, in and of itself, that's probably not bad. It's called a building program. However, notice how Jesus in the parable addresses him. Notice how God addresses him. You fool. Today, your life is required of you. Today, you will give an accountability. Was building the barns wrong? No, it was his attitude that he had, as if he had accumulated all of the stuff, as if he had orchestrated the abundance. God was not a part of his life, and there was a day of reckoning. And so when Solomon says, what advantage does man have in all of his work, which he does under the sun, there is no advantage. Now he's going to go on and talk about this a little bit more, but stop and think about it. Just stop and look at the financial crashes that America has experienced, probably going, in my mind, going back to the Great Depression. And all of, not all, uh, the 10 wealthiest men in America that, at that time lost all of their fortunes. And I believe, I read at one point, eight out of the 10 committed suicide. They lost everything, why? Because they put their existence, their happiness, their evaluation in their possessions, and it was gone. In a moment's notice, if you're in California, you could lose your home. You could lose everything that you had worked for. You, could lose you stop and think. You could lose All right, somebody turn off your mic. Turn off your mic. You work and and save and move to California, the golden state of retirement, and you build a beautiful place. And then a wildfire comes along and destroys and leaves you with nothing, with nothing. Same way with, with floods that have taken place and the hurricanes that have taken place, let alone many other things that are taking place in our world today. What advantage do you have of working and working and, and saving and building? Without God, you have no advantage. But if you have little with God, you have much. And America is losing that concept. He goes on to say in verse 4, A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. A new generation is not going to give purpose and meaning to work. The previous generation had a work ethic, unlike what some of us are seeing today as we try to deal with contractors. That older generation had a work ethic to it, but what was their advantage? Nothing, and a new generation comes along, whether they have a good work ethic or not. Do they have any leg up on the previous generation. No, they're not going to change the earth. The earth remains. The earth is consistent because God is consistent. Notice in verse 5, he talks about nature now. Also, the sun rises and the sun sets, and hastening to its place, it rises there again. God has created a systematic order that he is thoroughly in charge of. And it cannot be changed. Talks about the wind in verse 6. Blowing towards the south, then turning towards the north, the wind continues swirling along, and on its circular courses, the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, they will flow again. 
There is a systematic purpose to creation and God built it into creation and man cannot change it. Man can harm it by the careless and, and uh, selfish use of the natural resources, but the characteristics that God built in are there. And verse 8, after saying these things and trying to point out the futility of trying to understand these things, he comes back and says in verse 8, all things are wearisome. All things are, it, it's hard to understand. It's hard to comprehend. I, I can't make, I can't sense any meaning out of these patterns that God has put in. And when you begin to drift away from God, and like Solomon in first, uh, first, Second Kings 11, turn from God, you will not find meaning in anything that God has made. It will be frustrating. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. No matter how long I look at this, I, I'm, I'm not satisfied. I've been to Yellowstone one time, and um, Carolyn and I celebrated our anniversary at Yellowstone, ditched church, don't tell anybody, went to a little cafe, had a great breakfast, went in, in, into Yellowstone. Uh, that's where I chased a <laughs> moose out of the road with my cowboy hat which was probably a uh, God's protection in this old bonehead's life. But we saw Yellowstone. We saw Yellowstone uh, and Old Faithful. We were awed by this giant geyser springing up on whatever Acadia rhythm it had, God's nature alarm clock and it was just awesome to see but there were people there like oh hum oh well oh yeah that's nice it's like people who go to arlington national cemetery and they want to view the tomb of the unknown soldier and though there are signs posted about not trespassing and staying beyond the ropes and so forth and so on, there are still some very stupid, arrogant people who think it is all about them and they'll violate the rules. And they have no sense, they have no seeing, they have no appreciation, they have no understanding nor is the ear filled with hearing. Now he gets a little bit philosophical here. That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Now, I, don't know, I don't think Solomon really realizes he's talking about God and one of his characters, one of his attributes that God possesses. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What has been done today has already been done. Remember when Jesus told his disciples about praying and praying in the will of God, um, that um, you you bind things or you don't bind things. Now you, you got to be careful because our televangelists, you know, talk about them having the power to bind or to loose. That is dangerous doctrine that is not in agreement with the scriptures. The idea of binding and loosing in the gospels that Jesus talks about is our knowledge of what the will of God is and embracing that with faith and conviction. 
So what has been bound in heaven will be bound on earth. So what are some doctrinal principles that are bound in heaven? That is what we should believe that God wants to accomplish here on earth. He goes on to say in verse eight, uh, verse 10, after he says, so there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, see this, it is new. Already it has existed for ages which were before us. And that's where you get that phrase, there is nothing new under the sun. I don't know, there are some catchphrases that maybe we are old enough to remember. History will repeat itself if you don't change. Or don't you see what you're doing? You're doing the same thing that you did a couple of months ago. So in reality, what we are going through today in our world and culture is nothing new. It has happened before. We might not have gone through it personally, but perhaps our parents did, or our grandparents did, or our aunt or an uncle did. Truly, Solomon is correct. There is nothing new under the sun. There is no remembrance of earlier things. We have a tendency to forget. We have a tendency to forget what happened even yesterday. Or what was the sermon about on Sunday? What were the two main points about the sermon on Sunday? What was one of the hymns that we sang on Sunday? What do we remember? There is no remembrance of earlier things and also of latter th later things which will recur, which will occur. We are a forgetful people. And forgetfulness breeds contempt. If we forget what God has done, we can become complacent. We can become apathetic. We can become almost imposing our selfish will upon God. Well, God, you did it in the past. You need to do it now. And you need to do it in the same way. God is not obligated to do that. There will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. There should be a red flag and some whistles going off in your mind for those of you who were with us for the book of Judges. And even, I think, two minor prophets ago, I made reference to this. Uh, in particular, uh, Jonah, there was a generation that grew up, if you please, that returned to their brutality. And that was the prophecy of Nahum, chapter 2, coming out on Jonah, chapter 1, if you please. But as the Israelites entered into the promised land after they had conquered it in Joshua, and they get into Judges here. There was a generation after Joshua died and the elders that grew up and did not know the mighty works of God. They did not remember. They did not remember. Are we in that culture today? Are we seeing people who do not remember what has been done in the past? They are unobservant about the hand of God, both in blessing and in discipline. And I believe every generation has that segment to it. But I also believe with each passing generation that that segment can get bigger and bigger and bigger. Apart from the creator God, here's my summary. Apart from the creator God, the world is empty. You ever stop and think about that? The world is empty. The world is vain. The world is meaningless. The world 
as is is useless. It doesn't make sense. Even the most ardent nature lover misses the true meaning of creation. Because if you cannot see God, you cannot really see creation. I'm going to read that again. Apart from the creator God, the world is empty. Even the most ardent nature lover, that tree hugger, misses the true meaning of creation. Because if you cannot see God, you cannot really see creation. And I substantiate that in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Now watch this. <clears throat> for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen being understood what has been understand through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Creation is the tapestry, is the painting, is the Mona Lisa, is the Da Vinci portrait of God. So how can you look at the Rocky Mountains, Canadian or American, and not recognize God or the seven falls which are in Montana I think it's got 136 steps to get up to it that was when Carolyn and I were younger how could you not recognize God there how can you not take a look at the sequoia trees and not say God put this tree here and all of the host of many, many other things. The very fact that man can go into space, and now they have civilians, go, go, Captain Kirk, going off into space. And he will see, that's one of the things he's looking forward to, he says, that he will be able to see the vastness of the universe. But I hope he will see the vastness of God who made the universe. Let me close with this visual. People look at our world. You and I look at the world. Believer and unbelievers look at the world. The question is, how do we see the world? Well, as we go through the book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to recognize that Solomon sees the world through the big word existentialism instead of through the word. The world will make sense if you see it through the word. And even though you might not be able to articulate point for point about what's going on in the world, you can look at the world and say, my God is still in control. My God is still keeping the universe on its axis. My God is still the creator God. We did not come from an amoeba. My God gives life. We can take a look at the world through the word. And the Spirit of God will help us make sense out of it. You might not fully appreciate like Habakkuk, but you have to accept what God is doing and the insight that he gives you. To reject the insight God gives you 
is rebellion, guys. It's rebellion. He'll give you enough insight to build your faith and opportunities to exercise your faith. All right. Questions from great readers. Any questions, thoughts, comments? Mm -hmm. No, 1248. Yeah, Solomon needed Luke 1248. Read it, Carl. What does it say? That's where it says, um, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required. Mm -hmm. I guess yeah. when Jesus was teaching his disciples, he didn't want them to fall into the same trap that Solomon fell into. Yeah. Good observation, Carl. Good observation. Hmm. I had something I wanted to say. Um, yes, I'm back and feeling better. <laughs> um, it's that I think, too, in these verses that we went over, it's how self-absorbed we come in our own lives that we can't see anything beyond ourselves. Very good observation, Sue. Yes. And when that happens... Do we have a clear perspective on our world or even God? That's true. No, we don't. We can't have a clear perspective because all we're seeing is ourselves. Yep. Here's a thought for all of us. And this will come out again and again as we go through Ecclesiastes. But maybe next time you have a hankering to do something and you think it's going to give you pleasure and purpose. Honestly, ask yourself if it will. When I accomplish this project, is it really going to give me purpose or pleasure? I think if Solomon began asking him this himself this question, he might have been able to refrain from getting sucked into all of his wives' idolatry and their pagan gods. Uh, but I don't know. I think it's a valid question to ask. Any other thoughts? All right. Thursday, Zephaniah, Zephaniah, why don't you read verse 1 and find out why the Spirit of God records Zephaniah's genealogy back to his great, great grandfather? That would be an interesting question. And then if you read through it, why don't you mark down how many times the phrase day of the Lord occurs. Sunday night, hopefully we'll wrap up on John 17. Sunday morning, we are in uh, Hebrews 10 uh, down to about verse uh, 24 or so. Hebrews 10 is going to be a three-part message. But um, on that next section in Hebrews 10, we have a debt of love to pay, right? Is that what the Bible teaches? The Bible teaches we have a debt of love. The Bible says in Romans, owe no man anything but the debt of love. 1 John 4 says the same thing. So if we have a debt of love, to our fellow man, we also have a debt of love to God. That would make sense, right? And so the question I would ask us, if, if we have that debt of love, according to that passage that is coming up in Hebrews 10, 
what are the four responsibilities listed to pay our debt? Now, we can never pay the debt back, but we have responsibilities in light of his forgiveness extended to us. I think it's going to be a very exciting message. I think it's going to be a very uplifting message. I'm looking forward to it. Well, if there are no other thoughts or questions,